What was the Chautauqua movement? It was a cultural, religious, and political education movement that began in the 1870s and lasted into the 1920s. An estimated 45 million Americans participated in the Chautauqua, making it a dominant force in American life during its day. Theodore Roosevelt, 1858-1919, hailed it as the most American thing in America, and, during World War I. 1914-18, Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, claimed that it was an integral part of the national defense. Some scholars credit the Chautauqua movement with sowing the seeds of liberal thought in America. The movement began in 1874 at a Methodist Episcopal campsite on the shores of Lake Chautauqua, New York. There a young minister named John H. Vincent, 1932-1920, of Camden, New Jersey. Endeavored to train Sunday school teachers in a summer camp atmosphere. The program grew in popularity and was expanded beyond Bible study and religious training to include lessons in literacy, history, and sociology. Chautauqua-style summer camps, commonly called Sunday school assemblies, began popping up across the nation, all of them featured a general meeting hall or pavilion set in a campground. By 1900 there were 200 pavilions in 31 states. Attendees of all ages would attend the summer programs, which featured speakers on a wide variety of subjects, including the arts, travel, and politics. Performances also became part of the movement. With a variety of musicians and entertainers joining the lecturers. Early in the 20th century, the Chautauqua became increasingly secular and went on the road as an organized lecture and entertainment circuit. Speakers and performers traveled from town to town, where tents were set up for weeks at a time to house the summer programs. Many Americans saw their first movies in Chautauqua tents. The movement died out in the mid-1920s, with the improvement of communications and transportations. Some consider the Chautauqua the first form of American mass culture. The Chautauqua Institute in New York continues to host a summer education program in the spirit of the original. How old is the compass? The first compass dates back to the first century B. C, when the Chinese observed that pieces of lodestone, an iron mineral, always pointed north when they were placed on a surface. There is evidence that Arab sailors were using compasses as early as AD 600, and as Arab influence spread north into Europe, so did the compass. By the 14th century, European ships carried maps that were charted with compass readings to reach different destinations. Portugal's Prince Henry, 1394 to 1460, also called Henry the Navigator, 
advanced the use of compasses in navigation by encouraging sailors and mapmakers to coordinate their information to make more accurate maps of the seas. Also in the 15th century, an important observation was made by none other than Genos navigator and explorer from Spain Christopher Columbus, 1451-1506 who noticed that as he sailed to the New World, his compass did not align directly with the North Star. The difference between magnetic north and true north is called declination. In the 16th and 17th centuries scientists began to better understand Earth's magnetic fields. American Elmer Sperry, 1860-1930, built the first gyro compass. A device that works day or night, anywhere on Earth even at the poles. Where lines of force are too close together for magnetic devices to function properly. When the gyro compass is pointed north, it holds that position. Before the compass, which simply indicates north by a means of a magnetic needle or needles that pivot. Sailors used the sun, the moon, and the stars to determine direction and navigate their ships. How old is the calendar? The calendar that is in general use today is the Gregorian calendar. It dates to 1582, when Pope Gregory XIII, 1502-1585, asked for a revision of the Julian calendar. That calendar is named for its initiator, Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC, who in about 46 BC commissioned the astronomer Sosagenes of Alexandria to develop a universal solar calendar to be used throughout the Roman Empire. As Roman armies conquered more and more territory, the empire included many peoples and differing calendars, including the lunar-based Roman calendar. The Julian calendar consisted of a year of 365 days, with one day added every fourth year, leap year. When the year is divisible by four, to compensate for the fact that the solar year is really 365.25 days. It had 12 months, each of 30 or 31 days except February, which had 28, and the new year began. On January 1st, the Gregorian calendar retained these features but revised the Julian to bring the Christian celebration of Easter in alignment with the vernal equinox, first day of spring. It also dropped leap years for any century year not divisible by 400 an effort to keep the solar calendar in line with the seasons. For example, 1900, though divisible by 4, was not a leap year since it was a centenary year not divisible by 400, the year 2000, divisible by 400, was a centenary leap year. Was Shakespeare famous in his own time? Yes, by 1592 he was well known as a dramatist. William Shakespeare 1564-1616, was the son of John Shakespeare, who belonged to the merchant class and Mary Arden, who came from a family of slightly higher social standing. His first plays, 
The three parts of the Henry VI history cycle were presented in London in 1590-1592. The first reference to Shakespeare in the London literary world dates from 1592, when dramatist Robert Greene, c. 1558-92, referred to him as an upstart crow. The critical remark notwithstanding. Shakespeare's literary reputation and his acclaim grew over the next few years. He experimented with classical dramatic forms in the early tragedy Titus Andronicus. 1593-1594, and issued a pair of narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, 1593, and The Rape of Lucerus, 1594. These works, which played to the fashion for poems on mythological themes, were immensely successful, establishing honey-tongued Shakespeare as his contemporary Francis Mears. 1565-1647, called him as a prominent writer. Shakespeare further established himself as a professional actor and playwright when he joined the Lord Chamberlain's Men, an acting company formed in 1594 when they began performing at theatres in London, in 1603 the group was renamed the King's Men. They became the foremost London company, largely attributable to the fact that after joining the group in 1594, Shakespeare wrote for no other company. Which came first the word Scrooge or Dickens's character Scrooge? The character Ebenezer Scrooge came first. Brought to life in Charles Dickens's extremely popular story A Christmas Carol. Published in 1843. By 1899 the term Scrooge, meaning a miserly person, had entered into usage. Dickens, 1812-1870, created many memorable characters. Oliver Twist, Tiny Tim, and Little Nell, to name a few. Among the English writer's most notable works are Oliver Twist, 1837-39, The Old Curiosity Shop. 1840-41, Bleak House, 1852-53, A Tale of Two Cities, 1859, and Great Expectations, 1860-61. Dickens was popular during his own time and is still popular today attributable not only to the vivid characters he created, but for his expression of social concerns. Though he grew more pessimistic in his later works, Dickens continued to demonstrate his profound sympathy for the oppressed and his belief in the dignity of man. What was the first university in the Western Hemisphere? It was the University of Santo Domingo, founded in 1538 by the Spaniards in the Dominican Republic, which occupies the eastern half of the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. Who was Alexis de Tocqueville?
aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville, 1805-1859, was only 26 years old when he traveled to New York with his colleague and friend. Gustave de Beaumont, 1802-1866, to study and observe American democracy. Though Tocqueville set out with the pretext of studying the American penal system on behalf of the French government. Both he and Beaumont were magistrates at the time. He had the deliberate and personal goal of conducting an on-site investigation of the world's first and then only completely democratic society, the United States. Tocqueville and Beaumont traveled for nine months through New England, eastern Canada, and numerous American cities, including New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Cincinnati, Ohio, and New Orleans, Louisiana. The pair returned to France in 1832 and the following year published their study. On the penitentiary system in the United States and its application in France. Once this official obligation was behind him, Tocqueville left his post as magistrate and moved into a modest Paris apartment. There he devoted two years to writing Democracy in America, 1835 1840. The work was soon proclaimed the classic treatment of its subject throughout the Western world and secured Tocqueville's fame as political observer, philosopher, and, later, sociologist. Tocqueville proclaimed that during his travels, nothing struck me more forcibly than the general equality of conditions. All classes meet continually and no haughtiness at all results from the differences in social position. Everyone shakes hands. But he also foresaw the possibility that the principles of economic equality could be undermined by the American passion for equality, which not only tends to elevate the humble to the rank of the great but also impels the weak to attempt to lower the powerful to their own level. While he warned against the possible tyranny of the majority as a hazard of democracy, he also added that law, religion, and the press provide safeguards against democratic despotism. How long have sundials been in use? Sundials, which indicate the time of day by the shadow cast by a stick, pin, or other object. Usually on a horizontal plate, have been in use since before the 6th century B. C when both the ancient Chinese and Egyptians used the device to tell time. Sundials proved to be a fairly accurate indicator of the passage of time. But it has its problems, a sundial can be difficult to read. The markings have to be adjusted according to latitude, and the readings differ with the seasons. They remain popular as garden ornaments today. Separation of church and state affected the public schools? Religion in American public schools continued to be a hot topic throughout the 1900s. But the Supreme Court rulings in the middle of the 20th century proved to have the most bearing on religious practices in state-supported schools. 
on June 17, 1963, in an 8 to 1 ruling. The Supreme Court decided that prayer and Bible reading in U.S. public schools were unconstitutional. The decision, in the case of Skemp v. Abington Township, culminated a series of high court rulings over the course of almost 20 years, which gradually removed the practice of religious activities from public schools. The rulings began in 1947 with the New Jersey case of Everson v. Board of Education, in which the court, in a 5 to 4 vote, defended the use of state funds to transport children to parochial schools, but warned that a wall of separation between church and state must be maintained. In 1948, in McCollum v. Board of Education, the court banned a program of religious instruction from the schools of Champaign, Illinois. In Engel v. Vital, 1962, the justices of the Supreme Court ruled that the state-composed prayer recited in New York classrooms was unconstitutional. How old is standard time? Standard time was introduced in 1884, it was the outcome of an international conference held in Washington, D. C. to consider a worldwide system of time. By international agreement, Earth was divided into 24 different standard time zones. Within each time zone, all clocks are to be set to the same time. The device of standardized time zones was necessitated by the expansion of industry, businesses, particularly those in the transportation industry, could not coordinate schedules when each community used its own solar time. The local time as determined by the position of the sun. Railroad schedules had been extremely complicated before the establishment of standard time zones, which the railroads readily adopted. Each time zone spans 15 degrees of longitude, beginning at zero longitude, called the prime meridian, which passes through the observatory at Greenwich, a borough of London, England. Time kept at the observatory is called Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. Time zones are described by their distance east or west of Greenwich. The model also dictates that each time zone is one hour apart from the next. However, the borders of the time zones have been adjusted throughout the world to accommodate national, state, and provincial boundaries. The contiguous United States has four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. Waters off the eastern seaboard are in the Atlantic time zone, Alaska, Hawaii, Samoa, Wake Island, and Guam each have their own time zones. Congress gave the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, authority to establish limits for U.S. time zones in 1918. This authority was transferred to the Department of Transportation, DOT, in 1967. When was the first kindergarten?
The world's first kindergarten opened in 1837 in Blankenburg, Germany. Under the direction of educator Friedrich Froebel, 1782 to 1852. Froebel went on to establish a training course for kindergarten teachers. And he introduced the schools throughout Germany. Such schools and classes for children ages 4 to 6 are the norm today in much of the world. How did Montessori schools get started? The schools, evident throughout the United States, as well as Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, Sweden, Austria, France, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Argentina, Japan, China, Korea, Syria, India, and Pakistan, carry the name of their founder, Maria Montessori, 1870-1952. She was the first woman in Italy to earn a medical degree and to practice medicine. In 1900 Montessori pioneered teaching methods to develop sensory, motor, and intellectual skills in retarded kindergarten and primary school students. Under her direction, these unteachable pupils not only mastered basic skills, including reading and writing, but they passed the same examinations given to all primary school students in Italy. Montessori then spent time in the country's primary schools where she observed the educator's practice of teaching by rote, by using repetition and memory, and their reliance on restraint, silence, and a system of reward and punishment in the classroom. She believed her system, called scientific pedagogy, which was based on non-coercive methods and self-correcting materials, such as blocks, graduated cylinders, Scaled bells, and color spectrums, would yield better results in students. Montessori theorized that children possess a natural desire to learn and, if put in a prepared environment, their spontaneous activity would prove educational. Instead of lecturing to their students, Montessori encouraged educators to simply demonstrate the correct use of materials to students who would then teach themselves and each other. She also believed in community involvement in schools, encouraging parents and other community members to take active roles in the education of the children. When Montessori put these principles into action, it was to highly favorable results. In 1909 Montessori published the Montessori Method, which was made available in English three years later and became an instant bestseller in the United States. Her method, which she believed would develop and set free a child's personality in a marvelous and surprising way, caught on. For Montessori, who has been called a triumph of self-discipline, persistence, and courage, spreading the message about her teaching method became her life's work. She was still traveling, speaking to enthusiastic crowds the world over. When she died in the Netherlands at the age of 81, Montessori's beliefs which were both scientific and spiritual had a Profound effect not only on students in Montessori schools, but on primary education in general.
When were the first schools established? The first formal education began shortly after the development of writing, c. 3000 BC, when both the Sumerians, who had developed a cuneiform system of pictographics, and the Egyptians, who developed hieroglyphics, established schools to teach students to read and write the systems. After the development of the first alphabet, between 1800 and 1000 BC, by Semitic people in Syria, religious schools were set up. Priests taught privileged boys to read sacred Hebrew writings, the Torah. The first school that was open to everyone, not just the upper classes, may well have been that established by Chinese philosopher Confucius, 551 to 479 BC who taught literature and music conduct and ethics to anyone who wanted to learn the Western model of education is based on the ancient Greek schools which were founded about the 5th century BC in the city-state of Sparta Boys were not only trained for the military, they also learned reading and writing and studied music. In Athens, boys learned to read and write, memorized poetry, and learned music as well as trained in athletics. In the second half of the 5th century BC, the Sophists, ancient Greek teachers of rhetoric and philosophy, schooled young men in the social and political arts, hoping to mold them into ideal statesmen. Why was Voltaire exiled from France? The French writer Voltaire 1694-1778, born François-Marie Arouet, Voltaire was an assumed name. Was imprisoned twice during his lifetime, he was released the second time on the condition that he leave the country. The prison terms and expulsion were the result of Voltaire's expert satire which first got him into trouble when he was a young man. After finishing a course of study at the Jesuit School College Louis Le Grand, 1704-11, Voltaire joined a group of aristocrats in Paris who valued the young writer's wit. He wrote and circulated verse criticizing the regent, the Duc d'Orleans. As a result of these offensive works, Voltaire was put into the Bastille, in 1717, where he began writing an epic, The Henriad, about France's King Henry IV, 1553 1610. Full of indictments of religious fanaticism and praise for toleration. The work proved highly controversial in its day. Such anti-establishment protests eventually led the writer to have an argument with the Chevalier de Rohan, a member of one of France's most powerful families. This conflict resulted in Voltaire's arrest, imprisonment, again in the Bastille, and exile to England in 1726. He stayed in London until 1729. Returning to France, the writer penned his observations on English social and political beliefs. Letters Concerning the English Nation, 1734 
Again stirring a controversy his exaltation of English liberalism was viewed by the authorities as a criticism of French conservatism. He fled the trouble by going into seclusion in Lorraine, where he stayed through 1749. The Biting Criticism Of his works won the writer fame as well as controversy, both of which followed him throughout his life. In 1750 he was invited to visit Prussian King Frederick the Great at court, accepting. He stayed there only two years he was forced to leave in 1753 after quarreling with the man he called the Philosopher King. He spent the last 20 years of his life in Switzerland. Returning to Paris to see a performance of one of his plays, Irene, just before his death. What was Goethe's contribution to world literature? Johann Wolfgang Goethe, 1749-1832, is considered Germany's greatest writer. He also was a scientist, artist, musician, and philosopher. As a writer, Goethe experimented with many genres and literary styles. And his works became a shaping force of the major German literary movements of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. His masterwork, the poetic drama Faust, 1808, rewritten 1832, embodies the author's humanistic ideal of a world literature one that transcends the boundaries of nations and historical periods. Indeed, the story of Faust, a German astrologer, magician, and soothsayer, c. 1480-1540, remains one of universal interest, and has been treated often in both literature and music. The legendary figure was believed to have sold his soul to the devil in exchange for the opportunity to experience all of life's pleasures. What was the Lyceum Movement? It was a public education movement that began in the 1820s and is credited with promoting the establishment of public schools, libraries, and museums in the United States. The idea was conceived by Yale-educated teacher and lecturer Josiah Holbrook. 1788-1854, who in 1826 set up the first American Lyceum in Millbury, Massachusetts. He named the program for the place a grove near the Temple of Apollo Lycers where the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle 384 to 322 BC, taught his students. The Lyceums, which were programs of regularly occurring lectures, proved to be the right idea at the right time, they got underway just after the completion of the Erie Canal. 1825, which permitted the settlement of the nation's interior. Just as the notion that universal, free education was imperative to the preservation of American democracy took hold. The movement spread quickly. At first the lectures were homegrown affairs, featuring local speakers. But as the movement grew, lyceum bureaus were organized. Which sent paid lecturers to speak to audiences around the country. The Lyceum speakers included such noted Americans as writers Ralph Waldo Emerson. 
1803-1882, Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864. As well as activist Susan B. Anthony, 1820 to 1906. After the Civil War, 1861 to 65. The educational role of the Lyceum movement was taken over by the Protestant-led Chautauquas. How old is the oldest clock? The first mechanical timekeeping device was a water clock called a clepsydra, which was used from about 1500 B.C. through the Middle Ages, 500-1350. One very elaborate clepsydra was constructed for Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, 742-814, in a d800, upon the hour, it dropped a metal ball into a bowl. Because of problems with water, it evaporated, froze, and eroded the surfaces of its container, a more accurate device was needed. It is believed that the first completely mechanical clock was developed by a monk around 1275. The clock was driven by the slow pull of a falling weight that had to be reset to its starting position after several hours. The clocks in monasteries were among the first to be fitted as alarm clocks. Striking mechanisms were added to the timekeeping devices so the monks would know when to ring the monastery bell. Other calendars remain in use in the world today, including the Lunar Babylonian, Chinese, and Muslim calendars, the Jewish calendar, which is a combination of solar and lunar and the solar Coptic, Japanese, and Hindu calendars. Secular calendars include the Julian day, used by astronomers, and the perpetual calendar, which gives the days of the week for the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, and therefore is used by historians and other scholars to reconcile world events along a single timeline. When did higher education begin? About the 6th century B. C. Schools of medicine existed on the island of Kos, Greece, where philosophers theorized on the nature of man and the universe. The Pythagoreans, followers of Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras, c. 580-500 BC, began the first schools of higher education in southern Italy where philosophy and mathematics were taught in Greek. The great philosophers Socrates, Plato and Aristotle carried on the Pythagorean tradition as did Epicurus and Zeno in the 4th century BC universities have a long history in the Arab world, for example. The Al-Azhar University in Cairo was founded in about AD 970 and is one of the oldest universities in the world. When was the structure of DNA discovered? In 1953 American biologist James Dewey Watson, 1928, 
and British biophysicist Francis Crick. 1916-2004, developed a model of the structure of DNA. Short for deoxyribonucleic acid, the acid found in cell nuclei. The scientists posited that DNA is constructed of a double helix. A spiral ladder, held together by hydrogen bonds. In reaching this conclusion, the pair relied on data gathered by British biophysicist Maurice Wilkins, 1916 to 2004. In the Watson Crick model, each rung of the DNA ladder consists of two pairs of chemicals. When DNA is replicated, which it is during reproduction, the ladder rungs are divided and the legs form new ladders, identical to the original. The model has helped scientists understand how genetic traits are passed from parent to offspring. Cells in the human body have 46 chromosomes, arranged in 23 pairs, children inherit half a set of chromosomes. Thread-like bodies in the nucleus of a cell, from each parent, and different combinations of the parent's DNA. A process called recombination, produces offspring of different, though related, inherited characteristics. Each person's genetic information is carried in his or her DNA between 10 and 20 billion miles of it. Which is distributed among trillions of cells in the average human body. The study of DNA's structure has proved invaluable to scientists working in the fields of evolution. Pathology, forensics, and many others. DNA's fingerprinting ability is so powerful that forensic scientists can use the DNA found on a single strand of human hair to identify the owner. In 1962 Watson, Crick, and Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking work on DNA. When was the flush toilet invented? The invention dates to the 1590s and is credited to Sir John Harrington. 1561 to 1612, hence its nickname, the John. A courtier and godson of England's Queen Elizabeth I, 1533 to 1603. Harrington installed a flush lavatory in one of the Queen's palaces. Though he was a serious scholar and translator. Harrington was also a rebel who wrote controversial satire, leading to his banishment. His invention of the so-called water closet was not taken seriously in its day. But over the following two centuries various inventors worked to improve it. Ultimately developing the plumbed sanitary toilet, a flush commode that is connected to plumbing and sewers or septic tanks. Who invented the thermometer? while the Greeks made simple thermometers as early as the 1st century B. C. It wasn't until Galileo, 1564-1642, that a real thermometer was invented. It was an air thermometer, in which a colored liquid was driven down by the expansion of air. So that as the air got warmer, and expanded, the liquid dropped. This is unlike ordinary thermometers in use today. 
which rely on the colored liquid of mercury to rise as it gets warmer. In 1612 Italian physician Sant'Orio Sant'Orio, 1561-1636, a friend of Galileo, adapted the device to measure the body's change in temperature due to illness. The clinical thermometer wasn't Santorio's only invention. As the first doctor to use precision instruments in the practice of medicine, Santorio also developed the pulse clock. It was a full century though before thermometers had a fixed scale. This was provided by German physicist Daniel Fahrenheit. 1686-1736, who in 1714 invented the mercury thermometer. Who invented the steam engine? Like many other modern inventions, the steam engine had a long evolution. It was first conceived of by Greek scientist Hero of Alexandria in the 1st century AD. The mathematician invented many contrivances that were operated by water, steam, or compressed air. These included not only a fountain and a fire engine, but the steam engine. Many centuries later, Englishman Thomas Newcomen 1663-1729, developed an early steam engine, about 1711, that was used to pump water. He was improving on a previous design, which had been patented by another inventor in 1698. But it was Scottish inventor James Watt. 1736 to 1819, who substantially improved Newcomen's machine. Patenting his own steam powered engine in 1769. It was the first practical steam engine, and what's many improvements to the earlier. Technology paved the way for the use of the engine in manufacturing and transportation during the Industrial Revolution. C-1750 C-1850, Britain was just on the cusp of this new age when Watt patented his engine. The steam engine was eventually replaced by more efficient devices such as the turbine. Developed in the 1800s, the electric motor, also developed in the 1800s, the internal combustion engine. First practical engine built in 1860, and the diesel engine, patented 1892. Nevertheless, James Watt's steam engine played a critical role. In moving society from an agricultural to industrial-based economy. Watt's legacy also includes the use of horsepower and watts as units of measure. What is a Poet Laureate? A Poet Laureate is someone who is recognized by his or her country or state as its most eminent and representative poet. Officially, a Poet Laureate is appointed or named by the government. England's first, if unofficially titled. Poet Laureate was Ben Jonson, 1572-1637, a contemporary of Shakespeare. Shakespeare acted a leading role in the first of Jonson's great plays. Every Man in His Humor, 1598. In 1605 Jonson began writing a series of masks, Short. 
allegorical dramas that were performed by actors wearing masks, for the court. Years later, in 1616, he was appointed poet laureate and in that capacity received a substantial pension. Among Johnson's works are Volpone, 1605, works, a collection of poetry published in 1616, and which includes the oft-quoted line. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and pleasure reconciled to virtue, 1618. Some sources trace the first British poet laureate back to Edmund Spencer. 1552 or 1553 to 1599, who is called the poet's poet. However, the title of poet laureate was not officially conferred on an English writer until 1638, when poet and dramatist William Davenant, 1606-1668, who was reputed to be the godson or even the illegitimate son of Shakespeare, was given the honor. Other poet laureates of England include John Dryden, 1631-1700, William Wordsworth, 1770-1850, and Lord Alfred Tennyson, 1809-1892. What did Shakespeare study? It is thought that William Shakespeare, 1564-1616, attended the King's New School. The local grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, where the main course of instruction was in Latin. There, students were taught rhetoric, logic, and ethics. And studied works by classical authors Terence, Plautus, Cicero, Virgil, Plutarch, Horace, and Ovid. It is believed that this was the extent of Shakespeare's education. There is no evidence that he attended a university. When was the first university established in the West? The first modern Western university was established in the Middle Ages 1158 to be exact in Bologna, Italy. It was in that year that Frederick I. C. 1123 to 1190, Holy Roman Emperor, asserted his authority in Lombardy. He granted the first university charter for the University of Bologna, authorizing its students to organize. The universities that were set up in Europe during the Middle Ages. 500 were not any necessarily places or groups of buildings, they were more often groups of scholars and students. The University of Paris, which today includes the renowned Sorbonne. The university's liberal arts and sciences division, soon became the largest and most famous university in Europe. The Sorbonne itself was founded in 1250 as a school of theology. It was reorganized in the 1600s by 1500 universities had been founded throughout the continent. Of these, the ones that survive today include the universities of Cambridge and Oxford in England. Those at Montpellier, Paris, and Toulouse, France, Heidelberg, Germany. Bologna, Florence, Naples, Padua, Rome, and Siena, Italy, and Salamanca, Spain.
the methods and techniques developed in these early institutions set standards of academic inquiry that remain part of higher education in the world today. Why is Milton important to English literature? Except for Shakespeare, the works of John Milton, 1608-1674, have been the subject of more commentary than those of any other English writer. Milton is considered one of only a few writers to take their place in the small circle of great epic writers. According to Norton Anthology of English Literature, in Milton's writings two tremendous intellectual and social movements come to a head. The movements referred to are the Renaissance and the Reformation. Scholars point to Milton's use of classical references and the rich tapestry of his works as being Renaissance in nature. While his earnest and individually minded Christianity are resonant of the Reformation. For example, in his masterpiece Paradise Lost, 1667, Milton, like poets Homer and Virgil before him, takes on humankind's entire experience, war, love, religion, hell, heaven, and the cosmos. But rather than having Adam triumph over evil through an act of heroism, he accepts the burden of worldly existence, and triumphs over his guilt by admitting it and repenting it. In addition to his famous epics, Milton wrote sonnets and other short poems including on Shakespeare, El Allegro, I. L. Penseroso, and Lycidas. His writings also include political discourse, chief of which is the essay Areopagitica, 1644. Among the ideas that Milton championed were the limitation of the monarchy, dethroning of bishops, freedom of speech, and the institution of divorce. One commentator mused that the guarantees of freedom in the United States Constitution owe more to Milton's Areopagitica than to John Locke. When were schools in the United States desegregated? On May 17, 1954, in the case of Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled, 9-0, that racial segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. The court overturned the separate but equal doctrine laid down in the 1896 case. Plessy v. Ferguson. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974. Ordered the states to proceed with all deliberate speed to integrate educational facilities. Also in 1954, on November 7, the Supreme Court ordered desegregation of public golf courses. Parks, swimming pools, and playgrounds. In the aftermath of these rulings, desegregation proceeded slowly and painfully. In the early 1960s sit-ins, freedom rides, and similar expressions of nonviolent resistance by blacks and their sympathizers led to a decrease in segregation practices in public facilities. How has the U.S.
who was the first to write a modern novel? While there are differing opinions on the answer to this question, it is generally accepted that the credit for the novel as we know it belongs to Spanish writer Miguel de Cervantes, 1547-1616. Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, in two parts, 1605 and 1615. It was the first extended prose narrative in European literature in which characters and events are depicted in what came to be called the modern realistic tradition. Considered an epic masterpiece, Don Quixote had an undeniable influence on early novelists, including English novelist and playwright Henry Fielding, who wrote the realistic novel Tom Jones, 1749. Don Quixote is also said to have anticipated later fictional masterpieces, including French novelist Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary, 1857, Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Idiot, 1868 to 69, and American writer Mark Twain's The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876 and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1884. How did the novel develop? Critics and scholars agree that it is French writer Gustave Flaubert. 1821 to 1880, who developed the modern novel into a conscious art form. Flaubert's Madame Bovary is recognized for its objective characterization, irony, narrative technique, and use of imagery and symbolism. American writer and naturalized British citizen Henry James. 1843 to 1916 is acknowledged for having enlarged the scope of the novel, introducing dramatic elements to the narrative, developing point of view technique, and advocating realism in literature. James's works include The American, 1877, Daisy Miller, 1879. The Portrait of a Lady, 1881, and The Ambassadors, 1903. Irish writer James Joyce, 1882-1941, considered the most prominent English-speaking literary figure of the first half of the 20th century, is often credited with redefining the modern novel. Joyce experimented with the form and revolutionized it through his first novel. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 1916, and with his masterpiece, Ulysses, 1922. In which he developed the techniques of interior monologue and stream of conscious narrative. Writer William Faulkner, 1897-1962. Was the American counterpart to Joyce's experimentation with the form of the novel. The author of The Sound and the Fury, 1929, Light in August, 1932, and Absalom, Absalom. 1936, among others, Faulkner, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1949 stated that the fundamental theme of his fiction is the human heart in conflict with itself. This he explored by employing a variety of narrative techniques. 
which, like Joyce's, departed radically from traditional methods. How did the novel develop? Critics and scholars agree that it is French writer Gustave Flaubert. 1821-1880, who developed the modern novel into a conscious art form. Flaubert's Madame Bovary is recognized for its objective characterization. Irony, narrative technique, and use of imagery and symbolism. American writer, and naturalized British citizen, Henry James. 1843-1916, is acknowledged for having enlarged the scope of the novel, introducing dramatic elements to the narrative. Developing point of view technique, and advocating realism in literature. James's works include The American, 1877, Daisy Miller, 1879. The Portrait of a Lady, 1881, and The Ambassadors, 1903. Irish writer James Joyce, 1882-1941, considered the most prominent English-speaking literary figure of the first half of the 20th century, is often credited with redefining the modern novel. Joyce experimented with the form and revolutionized it through his first novel. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 1916, and with his masterpiece, Ulysses, 1922. In which he developed the techniques of interior monologue and stream of conscious narrative. Writer William Faulkner, 1897-1962. Was the American counterpart to Joyce's experimentation with the form of the novel. The author of The Sound and the Fury, 1929, Light in August, 1932, and Absalom, Absalom. 1936, among others, Faulkner, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1949 stated that the fundamental theme of his fiction is the human heart in conflict with itself. This he explored by employing a variety of narrative techniques. Which, like Joyce's, departed radically from traditional methods. Why is Jane Austen widely read today? Austen is considered one of the greatest novelists in English. She wrote just six books during her lifetime, including her best-known work Sense and Sensibility. Published 1811, Pride and Prejudice, 1813, and Emma, 1816. But in so doing she created the novel of manners, which continues to delight readers today. The daughter of a clergyman, Jane Austen, 1775-1817, rejected the literary movement of the day. Romanticism, opting instead to portray life as she knew it. As such, she was the first realist in the English novel. Austen's works are ripe with shrewd observation, wit, and an appreciation for the charms of everyday life, making her an engaging storyteller for all time.
Why is Jane Austen widely read today? Austen is considered one of the greatest novelists in English. She wrote just six books during her lifetime, including her best-known work Sense and Sensibility. Published 1811, Pride and Prejudice, 1813, and Emma, 1816. But in so doing she created the novel of manners, which continues to delight readers today. The daughter of a clergyman, Jane Austen, 1775-1817, rejected the literary movement of the day. Romanticism, opting instead to portray life as she knew it. As such, she was the first realist in the English novel. Austen's works are ripe with shrewd observation, wit, and an appreciation for the charms of everyday life, making her an engaging storyteller for all time. Why is Moby Dick considered the greatest American novel? The 1851 novel by Herman Melville, 1819-1891, which opens with the familiar line Call Me Ishmael, has been acclaimed as one of the greatest novels of all time, many regard it as the best American novel. Of course, determining the best is a purely subjective matter. And Melville's work has many worthy rivals for the distinction, but Moby Dick remains a compelling and finely wrought work in spite of the fact that it was not appreciated in its day. The story of a whaling captain's obsessive search for the whale that ripped off his leg. Moby Dick is both an exciting tale of the high seas and an interesting allegory. Interpreted as the human quest to understand the ultimately unknowable ways of God. The work first received notoriety some 30 years after Melville's death. Why is Moby Dick considered the greatest American novel? The 1851 novel by Herman Melville, 1819-1891, which opens with the familiar line Call Me Ishmael, has been acclaimed as one of the greatest novels of all time, many regard it as the best American novel. Of course, determining the best is a purely subjective matter. And Melville's work has many worthy rivals for the distinction, but Moby Dick remains a compelling and finely wrought work in spite of the fact that it was not appreciated in its day. The story of a whaling captain's obsessive search for the whale that ripped off his leg. Moby Dick is both an exciting tale of the high seas and an interesting allegory. Interpreted as the human quest to understand the ultimately unknowable ways of God. The work first received notoriety some 30 years after Melville's death. Why was James Joyce's Ulysses banned in the United States? Irish writer James Joyce's, 1882-1941, masterpiece was originally published in 1922, 
it had been serialized prior to then. By the Paris bookstore Shakespeare and Company. By 1928 it was officially listed as obscene by the U.S. Customs Court. The reason was twofold. The use of four-letter words and the stream-of-consciousness narrative of one of the characters. Revealing her innermost thoughts. When the official stance on the book was challenged in U.S. court in 1933, the judge. John Woolsey, called it a sincere and honest book. And after long reflection he ruled that it be openly admitted into the United States. Random House, the American publisher who had advocated the obscenity charge be challenged in court. Promptly began typesetting the work in order to release a U.S. edition. But the court decision had important and lasting legal impact as well, it was a turning point in reducing government censorship. Prior to the case, laws that prohibited obscenity were not seen to be in conflict with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which is most often interpreted as a guarantee of freedom of speech. And the U.S. Post Office and the Customs Service alike both had the power to determine obscenity. The government appealed the decision to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. But Judge Wolsey's decision held. Why was James Joyce's Ulysses banned in the United States? Irish writer James Joyce's, 1882-1941, masterpiece was originally published in 1922, it had been serialized prior to then. By the Paris bookstore Shakespeare and Company. By 1928 it was officially listed as obscene by the U.S. Customs Court. The reason was twofold. The use of four-letter words and the stream-of-consciousness narrative of one of the characters. Revealing her innermost thoughts. When the official stance on the book was challenged in U.S. court in 1933, the judge. John Woolsey, called it a sincere and honest book. And after long reflection he ruled that it be openly admitted into the United States. Random House, the American publisher who had advocated the obscenity charge be challenged in court. Promptly began typesetting the work in order to release a U.S. edition. But the court decision had. Important and lasting legal impact as well it was a turning point in reducing government censorship. Prior to the case, laws that prohibited obscenity were not seen to be in conflict with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which is most often interpreted as a guarantee of freedom of speech. And the U.S. Post Office and the Customs Service alike both had the power to determine obscenity. The government appealed the decision to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. But Judge Wolsey's decision held. What is Proust's claim to literary fame? Marcel Proust, 1871-1922, is generally considered the greatest French novelist of the 20th century and is credited with introducing to fiction the elements of psychological analysis. 
innovative treatment of time, and multiple themes. Proust is primarily known for his multi-volume work A Lara Cherche du Temps Perdu. 1954, which was published in English as Remembrance of Things. Past. Proust was an creative stylist as well as shrewd social observer. In the mid-1890s Proust joined other prominent artists, including the great French novelist of the 19th century. Emile Zola, 1840-1902, to form the protest group known as the Revisionists or Dreyfusards. The artists were staunch supporters of Alfred Dreyfus, 1859-1935. And therefore vocal critics of the French military, who they accused of anti-Semitism for keeping the French army officer. Wrongly accused of treason, imprisoned on Devil's Island. What is Proust's claim to literary fame? Marcel Proust, 1871-1922, is generally considered the greatest French novelist of the 20th century and is credited with introducing to fiction the elements of psychological analysis innovative treatment of time, and multiple themes. Proust is primarily known for his multi-volume work A La Recherche du Temps Perdu. 1954, which was published in English as Remembrance of Things. Past. Proust was an creative stylist as well as shrewd social observer. In the mid-1890s Proust joined other prominent artists, including the great French novelist of the 19th century. Émile Zola, 1840-1902, to form the protest group known as the Revisionists or Dreyfusards. The artists were staunch supporters of Alfred Dreyfus, 1859-1935. And therefore vocal critics of the French military, who they accused of anti-Semitism for keeping the French army officer. Wrongly accused of treason, imprisoned on Devil's Island. When did American poetry begin? As the self-described poet of democracy, Walt Whitman, 1819-1892, was the first to compose a truly American verse one that showed no references to European antecedents. Throwing off both the narrative and ode forms of verse, and that clearly articulated the American experience. His first published poetry was the self-published collection Leaves of Grass, 1855. In an effort to gain recognition, Whitman promptly sent a copy to the preeminent man of American letters. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-82, who could count as his acquaintances and Friends the great British poets William Wordsworth, 1770-1850, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772-1834, the renowned Scottish essayist Thomas Carlyle, 1795-1881, and prominent American writers Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864 It was a bold move on Whitman's part, but it paid off, while Leaves of Grass had been unfavorably received by reviewers. 
Emerson composed a five-page tribute. Expressing his enthusiasm for the poetry and remarking that Whitman was at the beginning of a great career. Thoreau, too. Praised the work. More than a century later, biographer Justin Kaplan acclaimed that in its time leaves. Of grass was the most brilliant and original poetry yet written in the New World. At once the fulfillment of American literary romanticism and the beginnings of American literary modernism. Whitman's well-known and frequently studied poems include Song of Myself. O oh, Captain! My Captain, Song of the Open Road, and I Sing the Body Electric. While she was virtually unknown for her poetry during her lifetime, Emily Dickinson. 1830-1886, was writing at about the same time as Whitman, the 1850s, publishing only a handful of poems before her death. Collections of Dickinson's works were published posthumously, and today she, too, is regarded as one of the great early poets of the United States. Had more of her work been brought out in print, perhaps she would have been recognized as the first truly American poet. When did American poetry begin? As the self-described poet of democracy, Walt Whitman, 1819-1892, was the first to compose a truly American verse one that showed no references to European antecedents. Throwing off both the narrative and ode forms of verse, and that clearly articulated the American experience. His first published poetry was the self published collection Leaves of Grass, 1855. In an effort to gain recognition, Whitman promptly sent a copy to the preeminent man of American letters. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 82, who could count as his acquaintances and friends the great British poets William Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772 to 1834, the renowned Scottish essayist Thomas Carlyle, 1795 to 1881 and prominent American writers Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864. It was a bold move on Whitman's part, but it paid off, while Leaves of Grass had been unfavorably received by reviewers. Emerson composed a five-page tribute. Expressing his enthusiasm for the poetry and remarking that Whitman was at the beginning of a great career. Thoreau, too. Praised the work. More than a century later, biographer Justin Kaplan acclaimed that in its time leaves. Of grass was the most brilliant and original poetry yet written in the New World. At once the fulfillment of American literary romanticism and the beginnings of American literary modernism. Whitman's well-known and frequently studied poems include Song of Myself. O oh, Captain! My Captain, Song of the Open Road, and I Sing the Body Electric. While she was virtually unknown for her poetry during her lifetime, Emily Dickinson. 1830-1886, was writing at about the same time as Whitman, the 1850s, publishing only a handful of poems before her death. 
collections of Dickinson's works were published posthumously, and today she too, is regarded as one of the great early poets of the United States. Had more of her work been brought out in print, perhaps she would have been recognized as the first truly American poet.